So, after much messing about, there's a test piece again, unfortunately, for our crankshaft. So we've, uh, we've added on around about 8mm. And each shaft should represent... So that one is that side. And that one is that side. But the gap in between the two bearings has increased. Okay, and the cases. Just before I temporarily assemble the cases yet again, um, one of the main considerations for crank positioning is that your gears are in line on the other side. It's no good having it centralised in the crank if your gears are sort of off, out of mesh and things like that. So it's just something to check when you're building engines up. Um, that's where I want the, this temporary crank to land. I've got, around the other side, fortunately, that inner ring off the proper bearing just went into our temporary plastic bush. Um, more fluke than anything else. So now I can make, I'm just going to make a little spacer ring between that and this shoulder and then I can work out what spacer ring I need on the other side of this bearing, this, this gear rather, when um, when we've got it all sort of temporary assembled again. So I'll disappear off, make a, make a, a ring for at the back of there and then we'll be back again. Test plug that just slides in there. What we've ended up with there is a spacer that's very similar to behind the pinion on that other engine that I put together. With the assembly built up when the gears are together, it misses with that chamfer. Even with any little bit of misalignment, it misses the gear teeth. So we'll get that uh, put in the crankcase and see where we are. There we are so far with our, at the moment still the nylon bush in this side, but with our spacers in and our gear set up so that we are in line on the gear teeth. At that, the, the temporary crank is, is right back to the bearing on the inside on its shoulder and we've got our spacer pieces on that side so it it looks when it's assembled it looks worse than it is without the spacers simply because you're not seeing the crank webs there so it looks a bigger gap and the bush flange not being there on the on the inside there makes it look like there's a bigger space as well um, but remember when this is locked up to the drive side as the intention is then what happens over on the timing side won't really be an issue anyway um, on this side now I haven't got the spacer for the seal that goes over this bit to get to that so I'll just run one of them up quickly out of uh, something soft just so that we're uh, we're closer to uh, reality so to speak but there's a there's a crank turning if that shows up as turning okay I think this will work with the proper bearings in we shall see depends how accurate and concentric my uh, machining of my dummy crankshaft is just looking at this crankshaft the early crankshaft and it's step shoulder and whatever happened there whether that's as I've said many times whether that's where or how it is and then a square shoulder if we go to the other engine that fortunately I still have here 
and take a look at this one without its shaft on. That's got a, a nice radius in there stepping down and it, it does sit slightly back in the bearing ever so slightly with how this one has been set up with its uh, NKIB time inside bearing. The ring for the seal is like that with a with a, a big chamfer, a big countersink on that inside and then sort of square shouldered there. So that sits normally over there and sits slightly proud of the cases. Some of this I'm recording um, for my own notes um, even though I'll probably end up putting it in the video as well but it's uh, it's reference for me for the future. Also noted from the bearing to the edge of the splined part we've got around about 54, 53 and a half millimetres something like that on the proper crank and if we go to the earlier crank we've got around about 58 millimeters there so there are some differences in the in the length of this there's uh, about four millimeters more length in this shaft than there is in the earlier one or that could be that the web that's the difference in the web thickness possibly so they left the shaft length the same but moved everything over yeah that would come that would come there by four millimeters that's radiused so that's where our difference is so there's quite some interesting detail differences between these two cranks which gives me another problem in that oh, when I did the shoulder I've copied the original the old crank and really that needed to be further back and radius deeply radius in to just where it sits behind the bearing so I'll make a bespoke piece for this and then I can alter this at a later date. I'll get the case heated up ready to fit the bearing this you saw in the previous video but this time we're fitting that NA bearing in the timing. <laughs> bearing in that went in nice we'll come back to that when everything's uh, cooled down a bit there we are case is cooled bearings in there's the NA in and it's in a ring still slides in nicely I'll get the circlip put into that one Zoom in a little bit for you. That's worked nice. And there's our other one, our NUP 206E. Also in its case with its inner ring in from the inside and then from the outside the outer plate if you know here you can get this one handy the outer plate will go on there and then when the spacers are on and the, everything's on and bolted up that bolts the crank up to that side no doubt I'll mention that again as we go on so into the workshop and we'll try our uh, we'll try our dummy crank in there circlip fitted um, just as a, a note there's a right and a wrong way to fit a circlip um, there's the rounded side and then as you turn it over there's a flat side on a circlip and the flat side is supposed to go against the load so if your shaft's going that way pushing that way your flat side goes against your shaft it 
it's a bit like the uh, the thing with the right way and wrong way round for um, the clips on chains and stuff. So, not a lot of people know that. There's a time inside assembled. Now, one of the advantages of using this type of bearing or the one that's um, not got the retainer ring, if you're just doing a standard A10 or A7, and putting the bearing into the case and that onto the crankshaft, is that it's easier to remove for uh, for shimming, or potentially easier to remove for shimming without destroying the bearing cage. I think if I was I was doing a, a standard machine, I'd probably always do it that way, which is how Norton's are, which I think I mentioned before anyway. There's a temporary crank in. I've still not put the I can still float that way at the moment because I've not put the collar on the drive side. So there would be how a, exaggerated how a normal crank would be with its bush. And then there's our ring that would normally go on the um, where the seal is. And then just to temporarily replace my drive side assembly, cushion drive assembly. Oh, I'm, I'm forgetting something. Forgetting something. See, you were watching, you never said anything. Sounds like Michael Waller, doesn't it? I need to put on my um, plate for the bearing and there is a plain side and a chamfered side and we go chamfered side inward See this? no sorry plain side inward flat to flat that's right like that so that looks now to all intents and purposes like the side of the a normal bearing, a spacer collar. So then I better tube. And a nut. And I'll just hold the crankshaft in inverted commas, nip that a little bit. And there we go. And our end thrust is now taken by there's a little tiny bit of movement and that's just in the bearing and if we measure that it'll probably be, be less than the, the thou that you normally get so our end thrust or our axial control is now taken by the drive side main as the original early A7 but we've got roller bearings both ends and just need to confirm the gears still mesh and we've not moved the position of the crankshaft relative there we are and the gears are also in line that way so that far now for all that messing about with my temporary crank, the um, we can now, hopefully I haven't got to take this out again for a little while, but we can now play about and get the um, end feed conversion done. That's what I'm thinking of. Because people are going to be asking on this, we have with this setup 12 thou 
of end float in our crankshaft and that is the side to side play in that NUP 206E bearing. So the question is this, do you consider that too much? Is that going to cause problems? Is that sufficient axial location for the crankshaft? Now in, in this in the normal engine on this end on this end we have the cush drive assembly um, which is effectively forcing the crank in and out as it's trying to take up the shock loading driving through the primary chain um, so will that cause you a knocking as you sort of go under power the push drive kicks in um, long term I'm thinking this might end up as a probably a scrambles type engine and I'm considering if I do this I'll probably put a belt drive on it so not so much of a problem the cush drive will probably end up in the clutch I don't know yet uh, this this is something to consider with a ball race you'd have no end float Is the NKIB ball version the better way to go? These are all the questions that I'm raising with doing this slightly. Your case is already machined. It can take the NKIB bearing. I can build it up with one of them if need be. The end feed conversion part will still be the same it's only the crank location that's that's different so I'll continue with the end feed part of the crank then we can play about we're going to strip it down we're going to put the NKIB bearing in and see what you think be interesting to hear your comments so it's all experimental. Just while we're here, uh, that previous there's a previous clip where I measured the end float on this um, crankshaft with this bearing. I've tried another bearing, and that's got a lot less end floating. If I can get that there, I think we're down to about eight thou on that one of end float which is better. Now a confession here, um, I'm actually using very cheap bearings because I'm trying this out. Uh, they're, they're only like about £7 each. So it's probably a lot different story with something like a £40 SKF or similar bearing. Uh, but at this stage I don't want to buy an expensive bearing in case I change, I change plans altogether. So uh, apologies for being a cheapskate and um, I'll see if I can find some data on a better quality bearing on what the end play of the bearing is but uh, yeah just a different another one of those uh, codex whatever they were bearings a different one has got a different end float or end play altogether so uh, we'll see what a better one's like hello just want to do a further quick update I've been looking at this excessive end float on this bearing that I put in those cases and I've tried another bearing I can't remember whether I video that or not but that's got less end float I uh, said they were only cheap bearings so I've bought a, a fag bearing um, should be Germany disappointed that it's made in India uh, not that India's 
bad in any way, but when you're paying for branded names that are associated with certain countries, it's just one of my pet hates that you get something that's made somewhere else. If you if you buying a German name brand, you want a German made thing to me, but that's just me. I'll take you over and uh, just have a quick look at the findings. So I've just been comparing these two bearings. As I mentioned before, we've got the uh, expensive fag one there, and we've got the uh, cheaper codex one, which is the same type as is fitted in the uh, the engine over there. And just to measure the axial play in these, just before I fit one or the other, if I change the bearing again, I'm just putting them on the uh, on a dial indicator here. I'm putting them on another bearing ring. I'll bring this in a little bit closer. Actually. So I'm standing the bearings on a an inner bearing race, just as a support post, and then centering onto that, and then just sliding that under the tip of the dial gauge there, and just holding the centre down. As you can see, we're on about at about zero there, and then lifting the track of the bearing, we've got about 0.35 millimeters of axial float in that codex bearing, which is probably similar to what I had originally in the engine. Again, sorry, I've not got a an imperial dial gauge that will fit in this this stand easily and then to take the fag one and just centre that again under the the bearing I'll just go on to there and extend the same hold it down um, immediately I can see that that's sitting higher for a start so I've got to readjust my zero, so that's actually a little bit thicker by uh, 0.16, something like that, overall, which is an interesting observation. So we'll just zero on that, and then just hold that centre down again, lift on that, we've got about 0.2 on that one so roughly what I say that is 0.2 is about 8 thou and the 0.35 of the other one is about 14 thou so uh, yeah there is a difference in axial play between the cheap cheaper codex one which is made in um, made in Slovenia and the German made in India fag one. So uh, when we get to doing the the proper build on this, we'll uh, we'll put the fag bearing in. Now I've got another little bit of news as well. So I'll take the uh, take the camera walkies and we'll see what that is. There's our crank back together. That took took apart in a, a previous episode. I've just reassembled that. I'm going to clean it up a little bit and mic it up and uh, likely re-advertise that one because it's uh, it's no good for this project. And if we go wander over the other side I think you can guess what's coming. There we have it. That's a, a 650 A10 large journal crank. Now don't get too excited, it's not too bad on the journals, um, I've got to mic it up properly, but I'm aware it is, I'm just reading the label over here, came with it, uh, big ends minus 10, so 
the yes, the rusty but they're grindable to minus should clean up at minus 20 because they don't actually look too bad and the um, main journal is at minus 20 on there so for our NV conversion we're not bothered about that anyway bad news on this one is that you can see that in the camera we've got badly worn splines there so there's another little uh, little side project we can have a look at we can uh, try and do some spline repairs so with that and a clean up we're uh, with systems go I'm going to continue with the dummy crank in the cases for now and try and get that end feed part done and then we'll start looking at uh, providing that successful we'll start looking at doing it with with this crank um, and if that works okay we'll get it cleaned up we'll get it ground and I'll have to find some more rods actually because I've got small journal A7 rods only big journal A10 rods so our uh, our engine will end up as a, a 650 just for reference for the future for anybody I'm just going to measure the uh, the outside of these two cranks so that one we go in it's what's that reading 139 on there on the small bearing a7 crank across the flywheel um, webs and then the larger bearing a10 crank there across the flywheel webs we're in there 149 so there's uh, 10 millimetres difference in the width for anybody that needs to know that. <laughs>